Good afternoon. I am very excited to welcome you to this very special session at the Maine Public Health Association annual meeting. My name is Becca Bolas and I'm executive director at MPHA. As many of you know, each year we recognize excellence in public health by awarding the following distinctions to organizations and individuals who make a difference in Maine. We recognize awards ranging from the Public Health Program of Excellence Award uh, to the Early Career um, Rising Star Public Health Award. This past spring, we held our annual ceremony, and unfortunately, one of our award winners, Assistant Majority Leader in the Maine House of Representatives, Rachel Talbot Ross, was unable to join us. So we feel very honored and excited to be able to recognize her today and then to take some time to learn about her racial equity work in the legislature and to hear from colleagues about these and future efforts. Representative Talbot Ross was awarded with MPHA's Public Health Policy Champion Award, which recognizes a policymaker who has made a significant contribution to public health in Maine in appreciation for her decades of activism and leadership in protecting public health and promoting health equity in Maine. Representative Talbot Ross was nominated by Carol Kelly, who will now share some remarks about why she nominated Representative Talbot Ross for this award. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Kelly, and I'm a public health consultant here in Portland. And I'm so honored to introduce Representative Rachel Talbot Ross, who is the recipient of this year's Public Health Policy Champion Award for her decades of activism and leadership in protecting public health and promoting health equity in Maine. If you look for the inspiration, the strategy, or the driving force behind Maine's most important public health policy achievements of the last four years, you're likely to find Representative Talbot Ross. But long before Rachel was elected to the Maine legislature, Rachel had already spent years in community service doing the work of public health. Affordable housing, healthy food, safe water, economic security, criminal justice reform, voter registration, Rachel's work in public health and health equity is far reaching, empowering and giving voice to individuals and communities. And on every issue, Rachel sees not only the immediate and specific need, she sees the system behind it and how the larger systems are interconnected. Rachel intuitively understands how relatively small investments, investments in individuals and communities and programs and policies can shift entire systems. Rachel gets the ripple effect and she makes sure there are plenty of ripples to propel us forward. Rachel also knows when the time is right to create some tidal waves. Maine legislature's creation of the Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial, Indigenous, and Maine Tribal Populations is certainly one of Rachel's finest achievements. The Permanent Commission is transforming how lawmakers approach policies and policymaking. It is both innovative and practical, courageously and boldly addressing long overdue systemic and structural design failures. Rachel's vision and clarity around systems paired with her understanding of the essential role of inclusion and empowerment of individuals makes her an extremely effective policymaker and advocate. And I'm honored to introduce this year's public health policy champion, Representative Rachel Talbot Ross. Congratulations, Rachel. Representative Talbot Ross, I invite you now if you would like to make some remarks. Well, thank you all so very, very much. Um, I want to uh, just thank Carol Kelly particularly for the nomination as none of this work, uh, indeed the health equity movement that we have here in Maine uh, could be possible without her leadership. So thank you very, very much, Carol. And to Becca and the entire Maine Public Health uh, Association family, I wanna thank you for this acknowledgement. Uh, I will um, also give my uh, gratitude to the brilliant work of the other uh, 2021 uh, public health awardees, uh, Nalinda Burke, Kristen Goodrich, Aaron Rhoda, Sarah Johnson, the City of Bangor's Wellness Committee, the Maine Access Immigrant Network Community Health Worker Team, and uh, the incomparable, the brilliant uh, Dr. Nara Shah. Um, I was so sorry not to be able to join you on May 20th for the Spring Awards ceremony and to listen to all of the other awardees. I am um, constantly um, just uh, inspired by their work and I really um, am sorry that I had missed that opportunity. Um, 
I uh, also just want to acknowledge that during this time, uh, this unprecedented time in our history, as we are trying to fight uh, the twin pandemics of COVID and systemic racism, I feel uh, proud that Maine has finally acknowledged that racism is a public health crisis. And I want to thank each and every one of you for doing your work uh, to make Maine um, a health and equitable place to live, work, and play. I uh, also just want to say that your resiliency, your courage, uh, it is your sacrifice and your commitment that really is the champion of public policy here in Maine. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you uh, so much. Um, your your deep commitment uh, to systemic change and to multi-sector and, and broad-reaching change is um, serves as a role model, I think, for, for many of us that are here today and for others that aren't. Uh, you are truly a, a trailblazer and your leadership is so appreciated and valued. And like I said, we are so honored to be able to recognize you today with this award and we feel very honored that you're here as well to share more about the work that you're doing in, in the legislature. And so for those who are watching for the next part of our program, Representative Talbot Ross will present about the relatively newly formed Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial, Indigenous, and Tribal Populations, which she co-chairs with Penobscot Nation Tribal Ambassador Molly and Dana, who many of you heard from just a couple days ago as our keynote speaker. After her presentation, Representative Talbot Ross will be joined by Deb Dietrich, Public Health Consultant, and Ian Yaffe, Director of Maine CDC's new Office of Population Health Equity. Um, and they will be joining in a discussion about some of the work that they are doing uh, at the state level. And so with that Representative Talbot Ross, I will turn it over back to you. Thank you so very much, Becca. Um, I'm very, very pleased to have the opportunity today um, to talk about the Permanent Commission uh, with each of, of you. Uh, it is a labor of love, I must say, um, and I uh, really uh, am honored to be able to share uh, the leadership with Ambassador Dana um, and all of the members of the Permanent Commission. Um, for those of you who do not know, the Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial, Indigenous, and Tribal Populations um, was established by statute, we can uh, change the slide, back in 2019 um, under LD 777, which I wrote and sponsored. Uh, I will tell you that was not the first time that I had tried to get um, this type of structure put through uh, the state legislature. Um, I did sponsor similar bills, um, the previous uh, legislature in the 128th, uh, and uh, just pleased that we were able to get this through. It is um, a labor of love because after 20 or 30 years uh, working in uh, multicultural affairs and diversity commissions and offices, uh, it was clear to me that that was not going to address the root. We were not going to get to uh, addressing systemic racism and interrupting the structures of systemic racism if we did not change policy and situate ourselves within the very body politic. Um, the other reality was uh, that with all of the work going on around multiculturalism, and during those days, we would not uh, be able to say that white supremacy was present um, in, in any um, uh, boardroom or meeting. Uh, but what was really the motivation was that there was very little work that would combine looking at systemic racism and the issues around tribal sovereignty. There was a gap uh, within our working spheres that did not look at these things as a whole stream of consciousness uh, that was perpetrated by uh, white supremacy. So uh, LD 777 became law in 2019. Uh, it established the permanent commission and statute. It um, articulated that uh, 15 commissioners representing a variety of different fields and populations would be the first commissioners. Uh, those commissioners were appointed um, by the governor, by the president of the Senate and the speaker of the house. We can move on. The one, the one thing I will say um, before, I just wanna highlight is the very uniqueness of the permanent commission is the fact that there are four uh, individual tribal nations that are represented on the commission. And we feel like that is a, a critical distinction between efforts around diversity, equity, inclusion, and multiculturalism and what the permanent commissions uh, uh, is comprised of. Uh, 
So our mission and structure, um, it is in statute again, uh, to examine racism across all systems, advance strategies and policies that eliminate disparities and create opportunities for an equitable Maine. I, uh, it, that is an important mission because it is not just about the disparities. This is not looking at the, li the life and the status of racial indigenous populations from a deficit model. It is using those disparities as one of the tools that will interrupt systemic racism and structural racism, get us to a place of health equity, but the entire mission is not just devoted to the elimination of disparities. Uh, it is devoted to the elimination of those disparities and the creation of opportunity and access and equitable outcomes for all Mainers. Uh, we do advise all three branches of state government. Uh, the Permanent Commission is empowered to submit its own legislation. We are uh, empowered to commit, uh, conduct public hearings. Uh, one of the things we are very proud about is our ability to conduct research, publish that research, develop public policy, and certainly to engage and empower the community and the public uh, within their own quest for self-determination and self-independence. The structure, while we started with 15 commissioners, we have now um, grown to 17 commissioners. It does include two co-chairs. Our organizational structure has five standing committees. Uh, we do now have professional staff. We're taking on subject matter experts, VISTA volunteers, and eventually we will establish a policy and research fellowship and internships. Uh, so uh, in order to seed uh, BIPOC uh, populations in Maine into the research and policy fields, you can go to the next slide. Um, in um, getting um, ourselves organized and realizing our mission, uh, the Permanent Commission undertook at the request of the legislative branch, um, a review of 455 legislative bills that were um, left over in the 129th legislature when we adjourned uh, due to COVID. Uh, we were tasked with um, examining those bills uh, along with 55 other state legislators from across all of the political parties uh, to really uh, uh, advise the legislature on out of all of that, all of that work, all of that policy and lawmaking, what, what bills would actually have a positive impact in uh, moving those uh, disparities forward. Uh, we created uh, a number of different catch-all categories and I will say that out of 455 bills, uh, only 26 of those bills uh, made it to the highest ranking of tier one, which would have a demonstrable, measurable, evaluative uh, impact on improving outcomes. So that's less than 10% um, uh, of the bills uh, would have had that impact. And I really hope that you sit with that reality that um, of 455 bills that appear race neutral, um, only 26 would have risen to the uh, place of positive impact for racial, indigenous, and tribal populations, 26. Um, we can move on. I, we will put as one of the resources for uh, attendees a copy of uh, that uh, report for you to um, peruse at another time. Uh, moving into 2022, uh, the Permanent Commission fought for baseline funding in the state budget uh, you know, as I know, that the um, way that you see the priorities of a state uh, sometimes is through its budget. And we knew that in order for us to do our work, which is a very large mission, um, that we needed to fight for baseline budget. Um, we um, did pass a historic bill, uh, LD 1034, uh, the first time that an investment by the state of Maine can be seen in the state budget. Um, on these populations um, in an effort to fight systemic racism that uh, passed and we were able to um, hire professional staff, able to establish an office, bring our public hearings, community engagement work forward. Uh, and we were uh, in really, really proud of that historic investment by the state of Maine, uh, driven by the Maine State Legislature. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so just to kind of really give you a visual on our foundational work, uh, we think of ourselves as a think tank um, with a heart, um, the heart being the community. Um, we are devoted to public policy research, both public, uh, again, moving towards a place where the Permanent Commission is actually establishing a uh, BIPOC-led think tank in the state of Maine. That is really one of the goals. 
Um, community engagement, we've talked about that is, um, that is the only way for us to get our work done is with trusting relationships across all communities throughout the state of Maine. Uh, one of the other uh, standing uh, bodies of work that we are taking on is a multi-year truth-telling, healing and reparations work uh, by the establishment of a truth commission next year. Uh, that work is being done in, co in uh, collaboration with Esther Atian and Panthea Burns uh, at Cutler Institute, who uh, designed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the Wabanaki Reach process, the only TRC process that has ever been conducted in the state of Maine. They will help guide our work um, in in uh, establishing a multi-year truth-telling, healing, and reparations initiative. And again, foundationally, we uh, advise all three branches of government. I will say with this slide um, that uh, in statute, we are also able to look at federal legislation and we are able to accept federal funds directly without going um, through a pass-through in order to do um, some very critical work that can aligns the state and the uh, federal work. How am I on time, Becca? Okay, uh, the next slide um, is to talk to you about, well, part of the work that we are uh, doing in, in our advisory capacity with the state legislature, six bills passed um, this year in which the legislature directed the permanent commission uh, to do some work. Uh, LD 870 um, is work, uh, a bill that was sponsored by Representative Bill Pluker. Uh, it directs the permanent commission to study uh, essentially land justice issues and to look at the historical disenfranchisement of indigenous Native American and African Americans, um, the, uh, the impact of being um, uh, discriminated against in access to land, access to grants, access to financing. So that really is a land justice bill. Uh, we have partnered with um, Bomazine Land Trust, which is um, uh, led by um, the Wabanaki Nations on land back, land trust uh, issues. We've partnered with them uh, to get that work done. And we have a report uh, due back to the state legislature with recommendations on how to address uh, those, uh, the land justice, land rights issues. Uh, LD 1113 uh, um, it directs the permanent commission to look really at um, the disparities in prenatal care. Uh, some of you uh, are feeling the impact of what's happening in Texas uh, and all across uh, uh, several states now where states are um, bringing uh, to bear, unfortunately, very repressive uh, reproductive rights um, uh, legislation. Um, and we are very concerned about access uh, to quality maternal care. Uh, Maine, as I'm not telling you anything, Maine has one of the worst outcomes uh, when it comes to maternal and infant mortality. Uh, within uh, these populations. And so uh, thanks to Senator Ann Carney, we're gonna be taking a look at that and giving a report back to the legislature. I'll move a little bit more quickly. LD 1226 uh, allows us to work with the statewide restorative justice coalitions uh, in looking at um, how we can literally put restorative justice in the criminal code and where it shows up in our education systems. How will we incorporate restorative justice in the ways that our Wabanaki and Abenaki tribes have, have lived uh, in a, through memoriam uh, in looking at the restorative components of, of conflict and in uh, uh, individual relationships. But So we are going to uh, try to um, bring a restorative justice into the criminal code and make it less punitive. Um, we have a couple of bills looking at African-American history. One of them is James Weldon Johnson. He's best known for writing the Lift Every Voice and Sing, which you will know as the Negro National Anthem. We're working with the town of Wisconsin uh, and many stakeholders, the NAACP, uh, our creative arts and uh, faith-based uh, community and bringing an annual observance to James Weldon Johnson that will take place in the town of Wiscasset where he unfortunately uh, was uh, uh, died uh, due to a train accident. Uh, but we are gonna bring forth his legacy in LD 1441. LD 1548, we will hear from Deb Dietrich on. I will um, make sure that uh, to pass that off to her. Uh, we are concerned about uh, COVID-19 and public health outcomes and really wanted to take a very deep dive with the help of Ian Yaffe and the whole team at CDC. Uh, you'll hear more about that bill, uh, but it's a very, very important a priority bill for the per, uh, Permanent Commission. And lastly, LD 1591, uh, it picks up from work that my father, Gerald Talbot, did back in 1970, 
seven, uh, in which there was, uh, by law, we removed uh, offensive names on geographical places. Uh, num a number of islands and public, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, public lands included the N-word and um, through the Honorable Donna Loring's work and the Honorable Donna, Donald Sectoma's work, uh, we also added the S-word, which was offensive to Native women. So this resolve picks up from that work from the, the early 70s because last summer we found five islands that used both the N-word and the S-word were still on maps and we need to um, change those names and then figure out a way uh, to honor um, um, other parts of our history. Uh, we'll go to the next slide and I'm hoping we're still good on time. Uh, this is a bill uh, that we thought we would uh, make mention to. It's really important um, for, uh, for this audience to understand the passage of this landmark legislation. Uh, it was not uh, put forth by the Permanent Commission, but it does direct all of our work. And we do believe that uh, new bills will come forth from us uh, that address this. LD2 uh, is a bill that defined racial impact statements and statute as an assessment of the potential impact legislation could have on historically disadvantaged racial populations. This bill is necessary based on what the report, the Permanent Commission's report just proved. Out of 455 bills, only 26 would actually move forward the status of disadvantaged racial populations. That means we need some tools and racial impact statements are just one. We need some tools that make sure that those 420 other bills that look race neutral on face do not um, either cause further harm and exasperated disparity or just leave it at neutral. Um, we have to take specific intentional steps to move the status of historically disadvantaged racial populations into a positive direction uh, if we are going to achieve health equity uh, and racial and racial justice. LD2 um, starts off as a pilot program. I'm pleased to report that we are working on this right now. Uh, we will pilot this all of next year during the second regular term of the 130th, and then we'll come back and move that forward um, into the 131st so that hopefully, eventually, we will be able to use a metrics, um, a tool that will um, uh, allow us in our lawmaking process to determine if the bill will have a negative impact or remain um, a uh, disparate impact on all of the legislation uh, that comes before the legislature. It's a very powerful bill. We can move on. I think uh, just very quickly before I hand this off to Deb and then to Ian, um, these are some of bills of interest for the Permanent Commission. I will um, invite you to stay in touch with us as we will produce a priority list uh, for the second regular term of the 130th soon. Uh, but what's on our radar right now is LD-151. It's sponsored by Representative Tom Harnett. It is an absolutely critical bill uh, uh, that brings uh, farm workers in uh, uh, allows them to organize. Um, it uh, is sitting right now on the governor's desk. If there's a call to action right now, I would say for you to uh, get in touch with your legislators, get in touch with the governor's office. This bill was held over, um, which means we need to push. Uh, and if you believe in uh, uh, just the very tenets of humanity, um, <laughs> that all, all folks should be able to work with dignity and pride and receive fair wages for it. I urge you to call the governor's office and ask her to assign into law LD-151. If there's nothing else that comes out of today, that is my absolute uh, ask. Uh, LD-718 um, is to improve um, the health um, access to health care and health uh, uh, outcomes for those who are not covered by uh, our current um, Medicare uh, scheme and children's health insurance program. Uh, this is to make sure that all of uh, Maine's residents, regardless of their legal status, have access to, to uh, good health care. LD 1610 uh, is a data collection bill. And 1626, my other ask uh, that you heard a lot about from Ambassador Dana, is the tribal sovereignty bill. And we need your help on it. I think that is the end of my presentation. We'll go to the next slide. And I'll pass this off to Deb, and I thank you all for your uh, attention to uh, learning more about the Permanent Commission. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Representative Talbot Ross. That was an amazing and very complete uh, discussion and uh, presentation, and hopefully will orient uh, all the folks um, who are uh, with us today. So uh, my name is Deb Dietrich. Uh, I am very honored to have been asked to serve as a subject matter expert uh, to the Permanent Commission, uh, specifically on LD 1548. And I'm going to go over kind of the, the main tenets of this bill and then give you a very short, uh, brief update as to kind of where we are and where we're going with this. But first, I want to make just a couple of uh, introductory comments about why this bill was needed. Um, as many of you in the public health community know, uh, many changes have taken place uh, in Maine's population over the course of the past decade. And clearly, the data collection and data reporting systems, uh, if we, as we have learned with the COVID pandemic, have just not kept up with these changes. We also know that without relevant, accessible, and accurate data, it is impossible to implement programs uh, and evaluate programs and any other initiatives to improve health status. We absolutely need good data. The amount of resource that has been received in Maine and how these resources were allocated, particularly among historically disadvantaged populations for data, for community infrastructure and programming, is unknown at this point. And so that was a key reason for uh, creating this legislation. And I would also add that while COVID, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed significant disparities in Maine and elsewhere, there are many other conditions like heart disease and cancer that disproportionately impact specific populations in the state. So for those of us who work in public health, this is not a new problem but the COVID pandemic has shined a very strong light on these disparities and the deficiencies that we currently have in our data systems. So LD 1548 is actually a resolve. Um, it represents, and the uh, uh, language in the legislation speaks very specifically to a collaboration between the Maine Department of Health and Human Services and the Permanent Commission. The whole concept of this bill is to determine appropriate levels of funding needed by historically disadvantaged communities, including the federally recognized Indian tribes. And the whole intent of this is to build community-based infrastructure and achieve health equity. So this is not just a data collection exercise. It's not just an inventory exercise. The intent of this is to build community-based infrastructure and achieve health equity. So it has a much higher purpose. There are four areas that need to be um, explicated uh, during the next several months. And there is a report that is due to the legislature on January 15th uh, next year. So only in a few months. The four areas of focus um, are to determine the amount of federal funding allocated to Maine, that's directed to overall public health or healthcare purposes that was related to stimulus funds and COVID-19. And we italicize the important parts of each of these uh, just to put a little more emphasis on them. The amount of federal funding, the second piece is the uh, determination of the amount of federal funding allocated to Maine in any federal law that provided stimulus funds related to COVID that was directed or available to address racial disparities. Third component, to determine the amount of state and federal funding over the past five years that has been directed to historically disadvantaged communities, including but not limited to the Indian tribes, uh, et cetera, and importantly, any data or information related to that funding. And then finally, um, to catalog identify and catalog existing programs designed to target health disparities among historically disadvantaged communities, um, including uh, the Indian tribes, nations, and bands. So these are four major buckets of information, of data that will be identified, uh, cataloged, and reported um, to the legislature uh, no later than January 15th. So there is a lot of work um, to be done uh, over the course of the next few months. So um, there has been some progress. Um, we have initiated meetings with Maine Department of Health and Human Services leadership, including the commissioner of the Department of Human Services uh, and key staff to talk about roles and responsibilities 
Um, there will be other state agencies undoubtedly involved um, in this inventory. Not all of those funds related to COVID and the pandemic uh, went to DHHS. Um, and we also have developed a timeline and a work plan uh, for this work. We are contemplating the formation of an advisory committee or potentially um, looking to other advisory committees that have already been established uh, as potential sources of uh, both feedback on a, uh, a draft report, but also making sure that we're really doing a good job covering the waterfront um, in terms of uh, each of those four buckets. The outcomes of this process, um, there are four bullet points here that not all of them are important. Um, the establishment of baseline data for moving forward. We have talked about the possibility of creating a dashboard um, that would monitor um, how funds come to Maine, how they're dispersed, what kinds of programs are supported, what kinds of infrastructure is created, et cetera. We also uh, intend that this uh, process will inform the development or expansion of community-based infrastructure and health equity. Again, that's the real going forward piece here. Um, we want to not only look at what's happened in the past, but use this information to inform uh, further development. And that includes, by the way, data to influence uh, for further uh, or future legislation, as Representative Talbot Ross mentioned. It's a key focus of the Permanent Commission. And then finally, um, we believe this process will strengthen an already strong partnership between the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, Ian's new Office of Population Health Equity, um, and the Permanent Commission. And with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Ian. Great, thank you so much. Um, so as Deb and Representative Talbot Ross mentioned, um, I am Ian Yaffe. I've recently joined the team um, at Maine CDC and Maine DHHS as the Director of the Office of Population Health Equity. This is an office that is reestablished um, used to be called the Office of Minority Health, but it has a, a deeper focus now. Um, and it also reports directly to the director of Maine CDC, uh, Dr. Shah. And so in doing so really communicates a, a, an emerging and deepening commitment to pursuing health equity um, across Maine DHHS um, and across Maine CDC. Uh, we are particularly excited about the partnership with the Permanent Commission in the sense that the partnership between these organizations can ensure um, that we move the needle forward. Um, a lot of the times when we talk about health equity goals, we talk about where we want to be in 10 years, and then we go 10 years later, and then where we want to be 10 years later is the same place that we want to be. And so I think um, both of these two pieces moving together and particularly the way that the commission will elevate this issue and provide some accountability, um, I think really means that we might be able to have this conversation in Maine for the first time in a way that we could have some 10 year goals that we lay some infrastructure and systems to get to. Um, before I go too much further, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, just in terms of where we where we stand at the moment. And so the Office of Population and Health Equity um, really is based on the idea that our healthcare system is designed around the needs of the majority and that this leads to disparities in, in specific communities. And so as I begin to talk about COVID, I think what this reflects is something that we have heard for a while that that members of the commission have been talking about, community-based organization leaders have been talking about, which is that COVID-19 disparities are really a symptom of deeper root causes. They are not the primary concern themselves. They are, they are disparities that are predictable, they are measurable, and they will keep reoccurring. We will keep seeing disparities um, unless we do something different at an organizational and systemic level. And so with that in mind, I was going to walk through um, some of where we stand on COVID-19 disparities and how that relates to the priorities that Deb just laid out. 
um, in terms of building community-based infrastructure for health equity over the long haul. One of the things I wanted to start out with with this group is um, a map of the state of Maine uh, based on census tracts. Um, just a reminder that there are people of color that have been in Maine um, for, for generations. Um, Maine, if we look at Maine as a state is a relatively new idea if you think about the historical context of the land that we're on. And Maine being a majority white state is a uh, relatively new idea in terms of that overall historical context. Um, but nevertheless, there's a, there's a notion that Maine is a white state. It doesn't have to really think about health equity or um, racial disparities. Um, and I use this map as a way of demonstrating that that is, that is not the case. There are people of color um, all over the state of Maine, not just in Portland and Lewiston. Um, and, and that group of people are, it is the, one of the only populations in Maine that continues to grow. And so Maine as, a, Maine, as an example, was about 5% people of color 10 years ago. It's now 10%. And so that is um, not the only reason why this is very important work. But one of the things that we want to clarify early is that this work is, this work is necessary because of that. This work is necessary in, in spite of it. And the map that we see right now is reflective of the work that has not been done as well. Um, so you can move to the next slide. Um, despite being one of the whitest states in the country, Maine nevertheless saw the worst COVID-19 disparity at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, this is again, something that was predictable. It's something that folks knew was gonna happen because whenever there's a public health emergency, whenever there's an environmental emergency, um, it's people that are at the margins that are most directly impacted fastest and most deeply. And so this graph shows, um, shows that impact in a pretty alarming sense. Um, in June of 2020, about half of the people who tested positive for COVID-19 were people of color in, in Maine. Um, so that is an alarming disparity um, that has since subsided as the pandemic spread into, into different places of the state, but nevertheless represents the urgency of this work and the urgency to think about how to prevent that chart from happening over and over again with related emergencies uh, that we see that will keep happening. So the next slide makes sense. Um, this next slide is just something that I also like to highlight um, is that we, we tend to have a lot of missing information on race and ethnicity. Um, health providers often um, have trouble collecting that information. People don't like providing that information sometimes because of how it's asked. And so when we see surges in cases happening, we see decreasing um, completion of those racial and ethnic fields that allow us to track disparities. Um, over time. And so I just want to highlight the importance of doing that because without these data, um, we won't know if we're making a difference. Um, that being said, with a lot of these systemic issues, we, we need data. We also want to ensure that our data doesn't become um, a, a, a something that delays our action. And so I think one of the things that we hope to do in the Office of Population Health Equity is to move to a place where we assume that disparities exist until, this, until data tell us otherwise, rather than to wait until the data show disparities, because at that point, it's already too late to take action. And so working with the Permanent Commission, we hope to develop new tools um, to be able to take action and to know what interventions are gonna be most effective based on um, new infrastructure developed at the community level and new structures for engagement um, and feedback from communities that are directly impacted. We believe strongly that the communities that are, are most directly impacted by these disparities are the communities that have the solutions uh, to the success. And we also believe as Representative Talbot Ross said that we are not in, a, in an environment of, of scarcity. This is not something that is impossible to do. Um, but it does take intentionality. 
Um, it does take specific interventions. It won't happen if we continue to um, do business as usual. We will keep seeing the results as usual and they are choices um, if we keep doing business as usual. So we're very excited um, to look at how we can better understand our data, how we can better communicate that information transparently with our partners and how we can use that information to prevent disparities from happening in the first place by focusing our efforts on the root causes that generate those disparities. So the next, next slide, please. Uh, I don't know if I get cut off, but if you could move to the next slide, that would be great. Um, um, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties moving to the next slide, which is, which is okay. Um, the next piece of the conversation that I wanted to talk about before we wrap up and have some time for questions is what do all of these disparities mean um, for what we're going to do with community-based health equity infrastructure. And with that in mind, I'm very excited to announce a, a national initiative from the US CDC that Maine is participating in, um, designed to reduce COVID-19 related health disparities that are linked to complex and widespread health and social inequities that put many communities especially people of color and people living in rural communities at higher risk of exposure, infection, hospitalization, and mortality from COVID. And so with this $32 million investment, which will be split um, by the US CDC among rural populations, and then um, what, the, what they call the COVID-19 Community Vulnerability Index, um, which is largely driven by racial and ethnic disparities, we'll be able to advance health equity by expanding our state and community capacity and services, especially among people of color and people in rural communities. And this is all based on the idea that health equity requires striving for the highest possible standard of care for all people with special attention to those who are at greatest risk of poor health based on social conditions. Um, so next slide, please. These are some of the reasons that the US CDC articulates as why we need to use this moment of time to build infrastructure and mobilize partners to um, further health equity. Um, and so we've, we've talked about some of the disproportionate rates of COVID and how those also correspond to disproportionate rates of other chronic diseases, public health emergencies and environmental emergencies. Um, Building and sustaining trust and ensuring equitable access to services are the way that we will move the needle here. Um, so next slide again. In Maine, we're still finalizing our activities with US CDC, but I wanted to share the three pillars of this grant and what this will start to look like in Maine as we look at advancing health equity. Um, number one we've been talking about is data and reporting ensuring that we have improvements to our reporting and data collection systems to identify and track progress on health disparities. This will also include community-driven needs assessments, so having community-based organizations um, being able to get their own data and determine what their needs are and share those needs with us while maintaining ownership of the data. Um, the largest area of um, activity here will be in exactly what Representative Talbot Ross was talking about is investing in infrastructure. And so investing in community-based organizations so that they can develop and enhance organizational management, financial and technical infrastructure to further drive health equity. So this will be um, a once in a generational opportunity for organizations to have investment happen that is specific to the organization, specific to the communities that they're working with, and that does not require them to reinvent the wheel. This is to invest in the organizations, invest in capacity, 
and knowing that that will lead us to being able to implement programs with those communities over the long haul. There will also be investments made within DHHS systems to ensure that those systems better reach diverse communities and deepen health and social equity. And lastly, there will be several initiatives for targeted health equity trainings, pilot projects to reduce rural health disparities and capacity building for district and local level public health organizations. So uh, there'll be a lot more to talk about with this grant as it gets closer to implementation and finalization with the US CDC, but I wanted to share as we do all of this work to identify where we're going with health equity infrastructure and what's needed, we're gonna be able to quickly make those investments this coming spring using the federal grant dollars that have been awarded to the state of Maine. Um, and so with that, I think um, I will pass it back. Um, and I think we have an opportunity. I'll pass it back to Becca. I think we have an opportunity to hear some questions and, and further conversation with you. Um, and very much looking forward to uh, the continued partnership here with the permanent commission on these projects um, and to um, the partnership with everybody that's on this on this meeting right now um, in terms of how we can all work together to do something different, to, to rebuild our infrastructure in a way that will prevent disparities from happening in the future, rather than continuing to react to them as they occur. Great, thank you. Uh, thank the three of you uh, so much for your very thorough um, overview of the work that you're doing. Um, at the at the state level, and how your efforts in the legislature and at um, in state government at Maine CDC can can work together to advance health equity. Um, there are some questions that have been coming in, and for this first one, um, Ian, I'll just start with you since um, you were just just up. Um, while your office is based in Maine CDC, do you foresee being able to work with other agencies, so broader DHHS or Department of Environmental Protection? Um, you know, other, other aspects of state government? Yeah, certainly that's part of the vision for this office is that it's a hub for health equity within the Department of Health and Human Services and that it also collaborates with other agencies um, to advance health equity. When I think about what's different about this office and in particular, why is the word population health there? Um, it's really around this Oh, sorry. Um, it's really around the broad idea that population health encompasses more than just diseases and injuries, but also the intersecting factors that influence health, like environment, education, mobility, poverty, racism, infrastructure. Um, and so all of those things come together when we talk about root causes. Those are the root causes that we have to go after here if in order to prevent these um, disease and injury related disparities that we continue to see along predictable uh, racial, ethnic, class, and gender lines. Thank you. There are a couple of questions about LD2. Um, the first is if you could elaborate a bit on whether um, the pilot is focused mostly on criminal justice or if it's across uh, committees. And then the second is if you could elaborate as well on the metrics that are being used to evaluate positive racial impact. Sure, um, I'm gonna ask if we can share the screen so we can see one another. Is, is that possible for the discussion? Um, so LD2 is not limited uh, to uh, analyzing impact in the criminal legal uh, system. If we can just take down the slide, it might be easier to um, uh, to, to, to speak, and I can pull um, back LD2 uh, back up. But when we wrote this, um, I was fully aware. I've been working on racial impact statements for probably 15 or, or so years, um, tried to uh, bring them to the city of Portland uh, for their use, and um, never was able to get that over the, the line. But it's really important uh, to not limit it to criminal justice um, arena. I think many states, the nine states who have done that, 
Um, and that's because where that's where their be uh, best data is, or that's where some of their data is. Um, but uh, it's really, really important for us not to, two things. One is for us not to just um, only want to analyze the impact in criminal justice on the lives of brown and black people, uh, given that we have disparate uh, outcomes across all systems. And um, based on the historical uh, outcomes, the generational transference of, of this disparity um, has to be acknowledged somewhere. And so with, with our LD2, we um, acknowledge that we have data in education. We have wealth and wage gap information. We have health information. Um, we have information on em uh, employment. We have information, uh, even in, with some environmental impact uh, information, we, we have that data. Um, is it great data? I don't know. Uh, are we missing a lot of data? Yes. But this is an exercise to uncover all of that um, at once, is to say, where do we have reliable data that can be applied to a set of metrics, which to answer the second question, we have not developed that yet. We're still in the process of working with Margaret Chase Smith Center, working with Cutler Institute, the University of Maine system, um, to develop those, those metrics, the, the measure, um, and what the weight for each one of those will be. Um, but it was really, really important that we um, look at, first step is to look at where does reliable data exist? Because then we, in the pilot, we can take those places where we have reliable data and apply them to a certain uh, set of bills that are before us for the pilot and then work it forward. We don't wanna just do an exercise. In New Jersey, they um, applied it to criminal justice and many of the statements that came out were, we don't have any data. Well, that's not very helpful. Um, so in Maine, the pilot will focus on first where the reliable data is, and then we will match that to the bills that are before us, and we'll process that through the through the pilot, and then and then be able to report out on our outcomes. It is a work in progress. My hope is that eventually we're able to apply racial impact statements to the budget, um, and so it's not just policy that we take this look uh, and understand its impact but that we start applying this methodology, this assessment, this analysis on all of the ways in which public dollars and public policy is being advanced. Thank you. That is very, very helpful. Um, another question is how can healthcare organizations incorporate racial impact statements in their work programs and policies? I don't know who wants to, to tackle that one. Well, I'll, I'll let our new director of office, uh, Office of Health Population and Health Equity answer that. I, and then I can I have my own opinion and Deb may have hers. But... Sure. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And we've been, um, we've been excited to see so many places asking that question now. Um, and honestly, um, you know, asking that question and making a conscious decision to develop policies that include a racial lens is such a foundational first step in moving the needle here. Um, and I think about um, basically needing to move organizations and systems from being in an equality mindset. Like we all agree about this, this goal, or maybe we don't all agree but maybe most of the people here agree that there's a goal that we should all have equal opportunities, equal access to healthcare, equal um, opportunities for success. Um, but that pursuit of equality can prevent us from addressing equity. And so moving from this mindset that we're gonna do one thing that's gonna work for everybody, you have to move into like doing specific things for specific communities and targeting those root causes first. Um, and so having uh, racial impact statements, um, whenever you're developing a policy at your organization, you can do the exact same thing. You could go find the Permanent Commission's toolkit. It has definitions. It has um, an, an example of how these things got scored. Um, and you can look at what is the effect of this policy. It doesn't have to be a law, but if you're going to change your hours like of your organization, what is the effect of that policy going to be? For, um, for people of color and for, for specific communities that you work with. 
Um, and that's where I think you'll begin to see that these things that work for 50% or more of your patients uh, and community members that you serve can really have huge disparities within particular subsets. And so that's the goal is really to stop looking at simply what's gonna work for the majority and begin looking at specific um, impacts of your policies within specific communities. Um, and, the, and the toolkit for, for, the, for the LD work that the Permanent Commission has been doing is a great step to start. And there's a lot of other organizations and people in, in Maine and around the country that have been doing this work for a long time who I'm sure would be would love to help you out with that. Um, so let me uh, jump in and make just a couple of comments. Um, also, having worked for a healthcare system for 20 plus years, um, I, I totally agree with your point, Ian, about making this local and community driven. And I think there is a huge opportunity for community-based organizations to reach out to healthcare providers, um, be they hospitals, be they FQHCs, be they behavioral health providers in their community and uh, forge these relationships using the toolkit that the Permanent Commission has developed and tools that others have developed. But that would be as opposed to, or in contrast to trying to do this, you know, across the whole state, because each community I think is gonna be a little bit different in terms of its needs and root causes, et cetera. So I would really encourage us collectively to think about a strategy that is community-based and then potentially have some opportunities to share experiences, you know, more broadly, even either regionally or certain kinds of providers, et cetera, but um, really to keep it local and to make those relationships uh, at the community level. Thanks, Deb. Yeah, I, I would I would just add one thing, uh, a couple of things actually, Becca, um, and that is uh, I would, um, so they say you don't know what you can't measure, that kind of thing. Um, so the quick answer is yes, but the, the elongated is um, we really need to have a, uh, a discussion about it because um, one of the things that we're struggling with at the state legislature is even if we have this reliable data, that's qual that's quantitative data, a racial impact statement also has to include that data is realized when you apply the qualitative to it. Um, and for us at the state legislature, the folks who would be preparing these statements are nonpartisan staff. How does a nonpartisan staff um, or within any of your organizations that where the statement would be produced. How do you not, how do you defend against anyone who would claim there was bias in the qualitative data? Um, so we are struggling with how do we get that lived experience with the uh, quantitative data so that nonpartisan staff, like they do a fiscal impact statement, can produce a racial impact statement that has a conclusion that lands somewhere. So that legislators can pick up that that impartial conclusion, apply it to a bill in their process. Um, so that that's a real that's a real quagmire for us. Is how do we put that qualitative information into the analysis um, that can't be challenged? Um, the other the other point is that we've looked at this extensively in terms of policy, and there's two things that um, we are realizing, and that is. Uh, those states or cities or municipalities would have, that are using racial impact statements, did the, did the presence of an analysis actually help to get the bill passed or, 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 or why didn't it? So what are the reasons why the bill didn't pass when you used the statement? What, what is the percentage that did pass by the use of it? And it's very, very low, I will say. And then the second uh, piece to figure out is once the racial impact statement was used, the bill was passed, did any of the outcomes change as a result of it? So those are kinds of some of the things that we're thinking about that I would uh, say that organizations should be thinking about as well. Thank you. This discussion is so helpful for, for illustrating the, the complexity. I mean, all of us in, in public health talk about systems change and, and we, we live and breathe it. You know, we try to contribute to it even, you know, regardless of what area we're working in or um, which part of the state. And 
this discussion right now, I think, is really, really highlighting the, the complexities of systems change across areas in the legislative process, uh, in state government, uh, in programming, um, working across agencies. It's it really is. Um, there's a lot to be thinking about, and I know Representative Talbot Ross in our discussions uh, with the Maine Climate Council's Equity Subcommittee discussions about data ownership and about how it's collected and, and how it's analyzed. I mean, there's so many layers um, to this. And so I've just, I've really appreciated the, the discussion that you've all been, been having. And I think that the, the, what you've outlined um, was, was very clear and I think very helpful for people to, to know what's going on. And then now leaving us all with a lot to be thinking about um, just in terms of how this is, is actualized and how it plays out and what we need to be be thinking about. So um, we are we are at time. Um, unfortunately, I, I could continue uh, listening to you all and, and, and chiming in, you know, periodically uh, for the rest of the day. But um, uh, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations again to Representative Talbot Ross for her award recognition, um, and thank you to Ian and to Deb for for joining uh, this conversation as well. Um, I want to thank everybody that uh, joined us today. Um, sorry I didn't get to everyone's um, questions, but, but thank you for, for your participation. Um, I do just want to remind folks to please complete the session evaluation. And we do have a 20-minute, uh, short but 20-minute physical activity break. Um, thank you to Ellen Thorne from Healthy Community Coalition of Greater Franklin County for putting together some suggested movements and, and stretch breaks. Um, and so we'll see you all back here at 1.30 for our next session. Perspectives on child care and developmental screening, navigating power dynamics, assumptions of knowledge, and COVID-19 in a community research project. And so with that, thank you all, and we'll see you back here shortly. Thank you.